Um, it's a pleasure to be here today, and for me, what's most important, I've only joined this morning, is that the whānau voice is what counts at the end of the day. So give the majority of time to our whānau to speak this morning is really for us as a privilege to hear, because at the end of the day, that's what we're all about. Um, I do want to acknowledge our two pō of Te Pō Matakana, who, who are here today, Dame Tatiana Turia and Professor Sir Mason Jury. Um, also, there's a number of uncle and aunties in the audience, particularly a dear uncle of mine, Uncle Fata, who I haven't seen for a long, long time, um, who I've brought up with. It's a pleasure to see you. And as I get older now, I have to mihi to some of my nephews, who are also in the audience now, that I didn't have to do once upon a time. The most daunting for me is probably sitting here, not in front of you all, but in front of my mother, who's here on the side and will be my greatest critic as I leave this, as I leave this podium very shortly. Um, we are slightly over time, so I, I, I realise I, I do want to um, speed up a bit on how we move forward. But today I'm here to share with you another view of another commissioning agency, which actually supports all the whakaaro that's been said today. And this is about how do you ensure a whānau centric model and commission for those outcomes with our whānau water pa partners across the motu, in particular looking at the North Island. I'm going to share with you some of the principles that underpin a whānau centric model for Te Pō Matakana, and how we look at a commissioning for outcomes and how we evidence those outcomes on the ground for who that matters, our whānau. But first of all, as I think your um, minister said yesterday, Get the, um, ah, here we go. I'm actually going to fast forward to yesterday because the minister talked about we actually have a conference going on up as many of you know in Auckland at the moment. We have all our whānau order partners from the North Island together in Auckland with Te Pau Matakana. They're there yesterday and today sharing these stories of success about looking at how do they achieve medium term outcomes for our whānau. Those that can't be seen immediately but where whānau have wicked problems that take a multiple integrated approach to making, making outcomes that matter happen for them. So I'm going to fast forward to that, if you like, first, before talking about Te Pau Matakana, because in fact, some of the stories that have been shared yesterday actually underpin our whole ethos of what we believe commissioning for outcomes for whānau is about. The first one is always about whānau storytelling. That's where it starts and that's where it stops. Yesterday, we were enlightened to hear a number of stories from our whānau order partners about the successes that our whānau have been achieving on the ground, and as we have heard today. And as we've heard those today, I'm not going to share so much about them, but I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the examples here yesterday that were on Twitter that came up. One, for example, was about families who are on a program. Usually on a program, you measure the changes and outcomes for families for a particular program. This particular whānau water partner also measured those families who he, whose heads were in the right space to do something, but whose hearts weren't there. We had an amazing story told yesterday of what we call those the tail end of our community, those whānau that takes a lot to get moving onto a programme. A lot of our programmes are aimed at whānau who want to go on them. Two years later, those whānau who wouldn't necessarily budge are now ready to go on a programme. What we were able to evidence yesterday for the very first time is often programs don't measure the readiness for whānau to go on to a program, the readiness to make the change. And we saw particularly whānau in very hard and tough communities yesterday, while it took two years of not giving up by kaiārahi, they were finally ready to go on to the program. As a result, a model was shared yesterday about readiness of whānau to engage in a program, because that's just as important to measure as well as being on a program. We had examples to Tihi, who shared a hapu result of looking at outcomes, not only by whānau, but by hapu. But at the end of the day, in summary, what Te Pau Matakana is interested in and what the stories told yesterday is that we're interested in looking at the waves of change for our whānau. As we said before, it's not about crisis and our families in crisis. The first step in any generational change for whānau is how do we avert crisis? How do we get whānau to avert crisis? Time and time again, our whānau come in of after having a plethora of programs thrown at them that measure their se success in a year. But you know what? The next generation down in that very same family are still walking through the door, still in crisis. We owe it to look at how do we avert crisis. The next outcome that we're looking at our stories is how do we support our whānau to become stable? They're no longer reliant on people to do things for them. They can do it themselves. 
How then do we look at our whānau strengthening the resilience? How do we then accelerate their whānau leadership? And as a result of their whānau leadership, and which we'll share with you later in our research program, we're now seeing whānau able to step up and become the community leaders and help sustain the communities going forward. For us, this underpins any generational change for whānau order. Whānau identifying their outcomes. That was the second most important theme in our, in our workshops yesterday. The first thing is, we can all sit here around the table as providers, as government agencies, and say this is the priority for whānau. But at the end of the day, you must first and foremost in any whānau-centric model, go back and ask the whānau first. What are the outcomes they want to achieve? At the end of the day, we're accountable to our own people. It starts with our own people. Examples were given yesterday of before programs were designed, go back to the whānau first, surveys were done, to see what outcomes whānau saw as their priorities. Very interesting. Sometimes they were very different to the providers and what they thought were the priorities were for whānau. That underpins any ground-up start to a program that's truly whānau-centric. Whānau water partners are then accountable for achieving the outcomes whānau desire. For example, when this program that we talked about for research um, and surveys. Lots of examples were given yesterday, and there isn't time to talk about them, about whānau-centric assessment tools. While there's so many assessment tools out there, a plethora of assessment tools that look at how they, how they relate to what you require to, to achieve in a service, where's the assessment tools that actually assess whānau's progress against their own outcomes that they want to achieve? Really good examples of best practice by our whānau order partners on the ground designing programmes and tools that suit and whānau being in charge of their own assessment and tracking their progress. Māori worldviews continue to underpin frameworks of whānau order. These were also shared yesterday. For example, Takitimu shared, shared one, we have a collective impact programme. They shared their whole Māori whakaaro on what underpins a collective impact programme for them. Secondly, we had another group in Auckland, Te Pai Heringa o Tamaki, who shared their model, Māori model for collective impact, talked about where the Pākehā whakaaro had come, how it related to the Māori whakaaro. So what you can see here is that through commissioning agencies working with whānau on the ground, we're really seeing some good innovation. But not only innovation, things that we already know, but just hadn't been articulated and be able to be shared. But now we have an opportunity to share them. The next thing is our Māori world views continue to also be the baseline from, what we, from which we operate together. So not only is it about the programmes we provide to our whānau, it's also about how we work together, as that's a theme that's already been brought up here. For example, they brought up yesterday whakawhanaungatanga. They, they gave examples of how do they model that when working together with other like-minded whānau order partners, other organisations on the ground to make things happen for our whānau. Another example in Auckland again is where iwi, uber Māori authorities and Māori providers have come together three years ago to do a regional collective impact initiative across Tamaki, unheard of a few years ago. But there is a whakaaro behind that baseline of whakawhanaungatanga. Measure what matters. That was the next thing that, theme that came through. Reporting on the change that matters who for. Reporting on the change from Te Pau Matakana's point of view for whānau, for hapu, for iwi. That's what matters at the end of the day for us, being accountable to our own. Takitimu, for example, gave an idea, of, gave an example where this year in their annual report, they're doing an annual outcomes report. They've identified here some indicators and they're going back to report to their own people on what change they've made for them. That's where it starts and that's where it stops, accountability to our own people and our own communities. At another level, we won't be able to share it today in detail, but one organisation, Te Whānau Waipareira, has started looking at social return on investment. They've done the first stage in developing a social cost calculator, looking at a whānau situation, the activities and outputs, whānau outcomes, high-level outcomes, putting financial proxies to those and doing a ratio of social value of return. The commissioning landscape. I'm going to share with you now, rather than me talk, a little bit about a video about what underpins Te Pau Matakana. When Māori communities flourish, Māori families flourish. A sense of whānau, or family, comes not just through blood relationships, but also the kinship we build in our communities, and a sense of belonging and pride in our Māoritanga, our Māori way of life. 
Fano Order literally means healthy families. Fano aspirations for their health and well-being are at the heart of the Fano Order approach, which enables Māori families to determine their own health outcomes. It's a holistic approach for Māori by Māori. Te Paumatakana commissions Māori organisations across the North Island who can connect with our people in a way other agencies don't and offer the tools Fano need to identify and meet their aspirations. Building relationships of trust, our kaiārahi leaders walk alongside our people, creating a conduit to a wide range of resources for collective impact. Te Paumatakana's approach is to commission for outcomes, with a Māori design model to express those outcomes. Recognising all elements of well-being and being able to chart progress in these areas is meaningful for Fano. We made a five-year goal to have our own house. It's insulated. We haven't been getting sick as much and finish level three, then do my degree. And it's been not even three years yet and we've accomplished all of our goals. So we need to set, yeah, we need to set some more. Building flourishing families means Fano Order is building Māori future makers. That just gives a little bit of an insight um, into what Te Paumatakana is about and complements the Fano stories that have been already shared today. So at the heart of Te Paumatakana's commissioning model is the belief that achieving outcomes for Fano are far more likely to be, to be sustained in the long term when outcomes that have been identified directly by the whānau themselves, so that the whānau is well placed to have a strong sense of ownership of the outcomes and the resulting transformation for them and their whānau, as you've seen today. Commissioning in action, a little bit about what we do. And I'm not going to talk about it today because you've had a plethora of outcomes frameworks, I think, um, over the last 24 hours, but it is on our website and that will come up later on this PowerPoint presentation. But I do want to say that um, we have developed an outcomes framework and roadmap that defines our policy for managing to outcomes. Um, this is also a blueprint because it provides a set of tools and processes to prove that we are having the intended impact and we are improving outcomes for Fano. It is co-designed and co-produced with our Fano Order partners and it enables our Fano Order partners to, to co-design and co-produce with their own Fano. And also it was signed off in September 2015, as you've heard earlier this morning, from the Final Water Partnership Group. And as a result of that, that's the basis for how we're rolling out outcomes. So there's a whole detail in here. What's interesting to note, um, and it's been brought up today, is one thing talking about Final Water outcome frameworks is another thing, putting a blueprint in place to enable that to happen, to change the culture where now some of our Final Water partners are used to reporting against contracts, output services to be able to unlock and shackle our Fano order providers, that they can actually do what they do best. Ask Fano, what do they want to achieve? Then have a menu of services that they can navigate them around, rather than trying to put them into silos, into services and contracts. And that's what underpins this whole model. But it is a change management process. It has taken at least three years to get our Fano order partners to the point where suddenly they can see how they're freed up to measure what counts at the end of the day for Fano. So we have a commissioning program. Rather than be specific about services, we've actually only got, we've got a very broad one. We have what's called Fano Direct, and these are on the website as well, which is our immediate term outcomes program. It's about meeting a moment of need for our Fano, And that it's a grant that Kaiarihi work with them and that they need over 48 hours. We then have a Kaiarihi program that looks at working with Fano over three to 12 months. We then have a collective impact program, which is about the medium term outcomes, as I said before, some of those wicked problems where well, you're not necessarily going to see the result in one year, but you're going to start to see the outcomes after two years. Because as I shared in the ways of change with our whānau, some of those changes you aren't going to see immediately. And we've got an incubation, what's called our long term outcomes program, slightly different terminology, but that's about where we've got a pilot going, where it's not about individual leadership, We've developed a Fano leadership program where our Fano water partners work with Fano to see how they manage their next generation, the next generation, and where they want to be as a Fano. So that's the essence of our commissioning program. We also do some co-investment. We've just started that. So, for example, the Ministry of Health has just recently co-invested with Te Paumatakana in terms of breast and cervical screening programs in some of our regions. 
We have an intensive research program. Dr. Tani Allport leads that and is with us today and some of her team. We have a whole Managing to Outcomes program. The thinking behind the outcomes, where we're going, where we're heading to. They do a lot of work in program design evaluation. The voice of whānau is really important. In this booklet here, and you'll see it's also on the website, on every program we do, we talk about the voice of whānau. So we have the whānau and we have some of their stories shared. Um, working alongside whānau order partners, for example, one of our whānau order partners is about to release its first social return on investment on a program. Another whānau order partner our research program is working with is for the last three generations those whānaus will be going to that particular organisation. What are the successful, the successful, not the unsuccessful, the successful determinants of that change for that whānau over three generations to really make a difference. So we're interested in what's flourishing, we're interested in how the well-being of our whānau. Um, we have 13 collective impact initiatives, 60 whānau order partners, because of time, I won't go into the detail, but we do have an outcomes measurement system called Fano Tahi, where we are able to now look at the transactional data coming out from our Fano order programs, what is being achieved by Fano, and what service is achieving this. Now, the difference between the data we're collecting as compared to some of our government agencies is that we're really um, thrilled with the fact that our data is well-being data. What worked for Fano? What changed Fano to move them to the next step on the continuum? Not only that, our database that we're growing is ground up. It's not top down. So these are the stories. This is also the data of change for Fano that was successful on the ground. So the new database, if you like, of wellbeing data that we're growing from the ground up complements the national data sets that are already in place. I won't go through this now, but there's examples of how we do our reporting now. We're able to report on our different programs. Um, I've, I've, just going to flick through these. Um, we can go from um, North Island level to regional level to right down to Fano level and look at the outcomes they've achieved against what they thought they would achieve. Um, but the other part of this, it's not just about the data, it's about Fano storytelling. Telling the story through the lens of Fano supported by data. The story of change told by Fano, though, is just as important as the outcome. So, how did the Fano get there? What was a change process for them? Often the outcome, if you like, is a full stop at the end of a sentence. But what was a sentence? What was a journey? What were some of the determinants that made that change for families? That's just important to tell through storytelling as also getting the data and looking at the outcomes achieved. It takes a while to get to that point. Our first immediate outcomes program, Fano Direct, has been running now for two years. So for the very first time, we have two years of outcomes data or what was achieved for, for Fano in the immediate term. Very shortly, we'll be producing our first immediate term outcomes program on how that went for Fano. But, but alongside that will be the Fano stories that go with it. So the two go hand in hand. So our partners and our commissioning activities, you can see we've got a number of Fano order partners throughout um, the North Island. I won't go into the details of that. I see I'm in the red already for my time, but anyway, I'll just carry on a little bit. But I'm gonna fast forward to tomorrow, which is really about our Māori future makers. So at the heart of TPM commissioning for outcomes is about a whānau-centric model, is about whānau wellbeing, is about measuring what matters for whānau, is about being accountable to whānau first. It's about a ground-up movement, sustained solutions that are owned by our whānau. It's a practice, it's a part of us, and as Dame Tariana said this morning, it has both our hearts and our minds, and that truly is whānau order. Te Pau Matakana is a commissioning agency that supports the aspirations of our whānau as they navigate their journeys towards becoming strong and resilient. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, kia ora koutou katoa. <laughs>